Hi, my name is Axel Bex, and I'm going to talk to you in the next 15 minutes on the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy in metastatic renal cell carcinoma. These are my disclosures. I'd like to start with this slide. As you may be aware, two trials that published very recently in 2018 and 19 looked at the role and sequence of cytoreductive nephrectomy in the era of VHFR targeted therapy. I was involved as a PI in CERTIME, and uh, the other trial was Kamina. So Kamina was a trial that looked at non-inferiority with a primary endpoint of overall survival and had very soft main eligibility criteria and investigated whether upfront nephrectomy followed by sinitinib was non-inferior to sinitinib only. The experimental arm with sinitinib only also included the option that patients could undergo a secondary nephrectomy in case it was needed or would have a clinical benefit. And I can, can already tell you that roughly 20% of these patients in the trial underwent secondary nephrectomy in the non-nephrectomy arm. And surprisingly, 80% of these patients actually, because they had a very good response at metastatic sites. In so time, the question was about the sequence of nephrectomy. Therefore, the design was a superiority design with the endpoint progression-free survival. And because patients were included that should undergo nephrectomy, we had a bit more stringent inclusion criteria using the MD Anderson risk factors as I outlined here below the table. Now, the, um, in certain time, patients would be pretreated with three months of sunitinib, and by default, the nephrectomy would be performed unless the patient had progression at metastatic sites. The results um, are interesting, and I would like to summarize them because I think they are pointing towards an overarching principle here. As you may remember, Kamina was the uh, more powerful study as they uh, included 450 patients. And their results showed that there's non-inferiority for patients who started on sinitinib and uh, in um, which 20% of the patients had a deferred nephrectomy. Now, in third time, there's even a suggestion that there may be an overall survival benefit when compared to upfront cytoreductive nephrectomy, which was actually quite um, impressive with a hazard ratio of 0.57. However, this was a secondary endpoint and the study was underpowered. So we have to be very, very careful when we interpret this. Interestingly, um, the Carmina team made an update at ASCO 2019, and they looked at um, reassigning IMDC risk factors to the Carmina population that was studied with MSKCC risk. So if you look at the uh, subgroup of patients who were treated with IMDC2 risk factors, and which mirror the um, uh, in eligibility criteria for CER time to a large extent, we see something very, very similar in terms of overall survival. Again here, the arm that started with an upfront nephrectomy followed by sunitinib had poor overall survival when compared to sunitinib alone. And as I already mentioned, uh, this group of patients um, also contained to a certain extent patients who had a deferred nephrectomy. So there's an element of third time in Camina, which we should not forget. And um, both studies, this was a post hoc analysis um, from uh, Camina, are therefore not confirmatory. But it is at least a very, very interesting hypothesis that when patients start on uh, systemic therapy and are then being offered to consider secondary nephrectomy when there's absence of progression or at least a good response at metastatic sites, will have long overall survival results. Now, whenever there's a situation that um, the evidence is not as strong, you see a re-emergence of um, retrospective data. You might be surprised about that after Camina and Sertime, but be it as it is. So um, these are results from uh, retrospective studies performed at our own institution at the NKI in Amsterdam, um, and uh, together with a couple of data from the Barts and Royal Free in London, and uh, Danny Hanks IMDC criteria. And both studies pointed uh, into the direction that patients who were treated at least with the policy of starting uh, systemic therapy followed by uh, deferred nephrectomy in the absence of progression had a better overall survival compared to those who had either no nephrectomy or upfront nephrectomy. It's always intriguing to think what could be the reason for this. Uh, 
you might think in very sophisticated manners about that, but it might actually be a very, very simple reason. And we found that in a post hoc analysis of Carmina, when we looked at the results that patients who were treated in the immediate arm only made it to systemic therapy in 80%. It took them longer, which is not surprising because they had to recover from surgery first. And um, the median time on treatment was 80 days shorter when compared to the deferred arm before these patients went into progression. Also, when you look at the deferred arm here at these spider plots, you see that um, because the primer was still in place, you don't have this, uh, this plummet in the size of some of target lesions as in the immediate arm. But what, what then follows is that um, the remaining metastasis or primary lesions, whatever it is, in the deferred arm has a more profound response than in the immediate arm. And all these things taken together might explain why patients have a better overall survival when they are treated with the primary in place. Now, this has been picked up by European guidelines. The ESMO and EAU guidelines therefore no longer recommend upfront cytoductive nephrectomy for patients who require systemic therapy. Please, let's not forget that. We are not talking about these patients who have low volume metastatic disease and can therefore treat it with upfront cytoductive nephrectomy. What we are talking about are those patients who require systemic therapy. And this should always be a multidisciplinary tumor board decision. Now, what has happened in the last two years, though, is, is that um, systemic therapy paradigms have changed. The um, investigational compound that was used in Camina and Sertime, Sinitinib, is now safely lodged as an alternative um, to immune checkpoint inhibitor combination therapies for patients with intermediate and poor risk. Now, patients with primary metastatic disease are primarily found in this risk group, and that simply means that it would be unethical to continue treating patients with sunitinib just uh, to follow them uh, the way they had been uh, offered treatment in Carmina and Sertime. Does that mean we have to redo trials? I think yes, but it's not that we have no evidence. Luckily, we have evidence from the um, pivotal immune checkpoint inhibitor combination trials, which show that patients that uh, have been treated with their primary tumor in place with immune checkpoint inhibitor combination, and these were 11 to 30 percent, uh, in exploratory post hoc analysis have a better progression free survival and overall survival than those who were treated with sunitinib in the primary tumor in place. And this is somehow suggesting again that um, the overarching concept of continuing to treat patients with a primary tumor in place if they require systemic therapy is still valid. Now, in that respect, Carmina and Sertime leave a legacy behind, and this legacy um, can be translated into the immune therapy era. And we already see a couple of scenarios here. The first scenario is admittedly um, very rare, but it has been described in some publications. What we will see more and more are patients who develop complete responses at metastatic sites, and then they may be transformed to no evidence of disease, by performing a completion cytoductive nephrectomy. On the other hand, we will also have patients who have very long-term stable disease, and they may possibly be cured because we look at um, potentially necrosis or scar tissue rather than still ongoing metastasis. And to illustrate that, I brought two cases. Very briefly, this was a 72-year-old male patient who was treated with um, his primary tumor in place with para-A, otal, and plural METC. He was IMDC poor risk received ipinevo, developed a um, immune-related adverse event, a grade three colitis. We know from um, uh, the severity of immune-related events that there is an association with good response. And this is also what happened. This patient developed a complete response at metastatic sites, then continued with his colitis when he was st uh, started on nevo monotherapy, which was then eventually stopped. And the patient was observed for almost a year without therapy. And he remained stable. Now, these are his baseline CT scans and the on-treatment CT scans here uh, prior before the decision was taken to remove this tumor. Um, you can see a massive downsizing. There was also the impression of ingrowth into the diaphragm and psoas. But look at that, this, this complete uh, absence of pleural mats, it's complete involution of uh, metastatic sites. So he then underwent successful um, open nephrectomy with a blood loss of 650 mil, recovered quickly, had an 80% necrosis, 
an invasion into the perirenal fat, but not into psoas muscle. So this patient is currently considered no evidence of disease. And the next question then is obviously, do these patients continue with maintenance or is it better to keep them off? Now this patient had um, adverse events, as you may remember, and he will be followed. Now this is a second case of a patient, 69 year old female with extensive lung and liver mats, renal vein thrombus, uh, INDC, intermediate risk with two factors, was started in epinevo a year ago, had a partial response in the liver, then a complete response uh, in the lung, continued with um, a good partial response, which then remained stable since seven months on nevo monotherapy. And uh, again here, baseline and on treatment CT scans, there were multiple small lung uh, metastases, I think about seven or eight, there's a almost 40% response of the primary tumor and a very nice stable response um, of what initially was a partial response of these liver mats. And we are now considering deferred nephrectomy in this case, and then potentially continuing with nevo monotherapy. Now we looked at uh, 60 patients, and that is a collective uh, uh, effort between the Netherlands Cancer Institute, Barts, and the Royal Free at Lon in, in London of patients who were treated with epinevo and their primary tumor in place. Now, this is a typical representation of these uh, patient groups. Again, like in Camina, 50% had intermediate risk, 46% were poor risk. And um, interestingly, we see something very, very similar that we already observed in the era of VHFR target therapy, namely that when the primary tumor responded, that this is associated with response at metastatic sites. So the bars uh, downsizing um, indicate the downsizing of the primary tumor. The color coding indicates the response at metastatic sites. Yellow is partial response, blue is stable disease, green is complete response, and red is progressive disease at metastatic sites. What you also see is that when there was less than a median of 10% response of the primary tumor, then these patients had an 80% chance to progress uh, with their disease. Interestingly, there is a lower frequency of complete responses seen uh, in these patient populations than in the pivotal trial, but this may change because this is a very early uh, investigation here. Now, there's another good reason to perform uh, upfront systemic therapy first, which I think stems from the seminal work from Summer Tourlich and Charlie Swanton at the Quake in London. Um, they have elucidated that um, depending on the driver mutations, some patients um, present with punctuated evolution. That means um, they develop a clonal subtype that is um, leading to rapid progression and rapid early death of the patient. And this can be distinguished from attenuated progression and certainly from those patients who have the VHL monodriver, um, which is very often um, synonym with those patients we see in clinic, you know, single or oligometastatic disease large primary, you can do an upfront nephrectomy and then observe them. But for all other patients, I think starting them on systemic therapy is important because it might also show you the cause of the disease, whether these patients respond at all. What you don't want is that you do upfront surgery in a rapid progressor, and then you're fishing behind the net. Obviously, we need to test this in um, uh, in a randomized fashion. I'm happy to say that two trials are, are ongoing. There are sequel trials. I'm in the steering committee of the Nordic Sun. It's a, a trial that opened in Denmark. Now 12 patients are already included. And for me as a former PI of CERTIME, um, I've, I'm, I'm very glad to see that um, the concept of upfront nephrectomy is not picked up anymore. So uh, in fact, what, they are, what both studies are doing is they will investigate both experimental arms of Camina and Sertime. So the question is, will it be sufficient to keep the primary in tumor um, after response at metastatic sites, or should we go for site reductive nephrectomy and then uh, um, keep them on maintenance therapy, or we might even further randomize them. So while these trials are ongoing, I think uh, we can conclude that Patients with primary metastatic RCC who require systemic therapy should receive immune checkpoint inhibitor combination first in analogy to Carmina and Sertime results that were generated in the previous era of VHFR-TKI therapy. As I pointed out, there's currently no level one evidence that deferred cytotoxin nephrectomy in patients with response at metastatic sites in the era of immune therapy is improving survival and clinical trials are planned. However, 
In the meantime, deferred cytoductive nephrectomy may provide benefit for patients in certain clinical scenarios. And also don't forget, for those who present with low volume of disease, there is good evidence from retrospective series, but also from a phase two uh, prospective single arm study that you can observe low volume metastatic disease before initiating systemic therapy. I thank you very much for your attention.